Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here today, to be here with you, to spend a few minutes for this important lecture. My sincere thanks goes to Dr. Howard White, my old friend, CMO, Mr. Zach Priest, and Mr. Ken Fox, and the Altian Health team to include me as a speaker for today's symposium. My English is uh, still Indian, so if you don't understand, please let me know, because I'm here almost 50 years, but unfortunately, my pronunciation hasn't changed much. I'm pleased to announce that we employ the best physician assistants. Thanks to Mr. Zach and Ken for their best selections. Keep up the good work and reward is inevitable. I will try my best to deliver to you the most practical information that is beneficial for all of you for the management in the emergency room setting. I will present two topics today with the time permitting. The most important is the GI bleed. The, oral, the, the next one is the oral anticoagulants, the versal time permitting. During the lecture, I may quiz the audience to, to break up the monotony of the lecture. Due to significant lengthy material to cover in a short time, please hold your questions till the end. Thank you. This is a little bit of information regarding myself. I'm board certified in surgery, plus there's not a single credential needed for a surgeon to have. I'm proud of that, but that's just including the, and I have published about five papers in the world literature, which are these. Two of them were when I was a resident, and the next three are in the last 10, 10 years while I was practicing ER physician. <clears throat> the important part of this take home message of today's lecture of the GI bleed is to clearly understand the underlying etiology, to diagnose and manage the upper and lower GI bleed in a casualty ward. That means the emergency room. They call in India, casualty ward. They don't call the emergency room. They used to, they still, now they're westernized, they went into emergency room also. But they used to call them casualty ward. In the most expeditious manner to minimize the morbidity and mortality. The gastrointestinal bleeding or hemorrhage is all forms of bleeding in the GI tract from the mouth to the anus. The bleeding could be from the upper GI tract up to the ligament of triads or lower GI tract, beyond the ligament of troites to the anus. Anybody know what the ligament of troites is? Okay, this is a small band or a muscular ligament which attaches the fourth part of the duodenum to the crust of the diaphragm. Uh, this is a landmark where the upper GI tract separates from the lower GI tract and very clearly visible during surgical dissection. It can, the GI bleeding can be acute, subacute, or chronic in nature. It may or may not be symptomatic. The incidence of GI bleed varies. Most common is the uh, lower GI bleed in 75% cases, but the upper GI bleed we see more in ER. 75% is upper and lower is about 25%. However, we do see more common rectal bleeding in the ER. Rather nowadays because of the invent of the H2 blockers and PPIs. In my time, there was none of those drugs. So we used to do a lot of surgery for GI bleed, peptic ulcer perforations, peptic ulcer bleeding, almost daily basis at night. That, don't, that no longer exists. And these are some incidences, 50 to 150 per adults for the upper GI, the lower GI is 20 to 30 per 100,000 people. About 300,000, almost quarter a million of people are admitted every year for GI bleed. 
the mortality varies from 5 to 30 percent. More common in males with a high mortality. Uh, anybody knows what the mortality of the cardiac surgery is? When you do heart surgery, you don't think so it's going to be higher? Anybody think it's a higher? Nobody. Actually not. It's a GI surgery has a higher mortality. The cardiac surgery mortality varies 1 to 4 percent, and the GI can go up to 30 percent with a GI bleed if it's not managed properly. So keep that in mind. So it's very important. Oh, who's that? Who knows? Uh, upper GI bleed is defined as the bleeding from mouth to the ligament of trite. It can come from the esophagus, stomach, or duodenum. It can be in the form of hematemesis, which is vomiting blood, or erector bleeding in the form of melanoma or mahogany colored stools. It also depends upon the severity, intensity, and site of bleeding. The more severe the bleeding, the faster the bleeding, the more you know, bright red blood. If it's slow bleeding, you get melanoma or dark stools. Severe significant upper GI bleed is a true medical emergency. Mortality, it can vary up to 10%, the total mortality, and may need urgent medical and surgical treatment. Anytime you have an upper GI, lower GI bleed, you first must rule out the patient is sick or not, does he need immediate surgery or not. This is a coffee ground material you always mention in the books, and it really looks like coffee ground, the grounds of the coffee left over. Well, I wouldn't know because I don't drink coffee. I haven't been getting used to in this country for 50 years. But I still drink my old tea, Darjeeling tea. Uh, the cause of upper GI bleed varies. Uh, it can vary with the age. Uh, the commonest we see in the younger patients is, uh, I pressed the wrong button. Should be pressing this one. Uh, in a younger patient, uh, you know, we see ulcers, and the lower patient, in older patient, we you, you see cancers. Yeah. So most commonest bleeding still is from the duodenal ulcer, but is going down because of the development of the PPIs and H2 blockers. And commonest the numbers are given here: percentage ulcers, erosions. Varices could be gastric or esophageal, pretty high. And uh, that means stop drinking, boys. Don't go to the bars. <laughs> and then gastric ulcer, but sometimes if there's a gastric ulcer, make sure it's not malignant. Very, very important, especially in the lesser curvature. The Mallory Weiss tear is a tear of the GE junction, uh, which is not common, but very well written in the books. I think I may have seen only a few. Uh, erosive gas esophagitis is very common nowadays, all stress working in the ER. Angiomas, AV malformations. Aortoenteric fistula is one of the special conditions. Keep in mind, anybody older patient has a history of a uh, aortic aneurysm repaired, graft comes with GI bleed. I have some information to share with you. There's always a board question in surgery about this. The GI stromal tumors are not common, but it can happen. Hemobilia can cause bleeding. Leomyomas are very important, can cause bleeding. Ble Although they are not really ulcers, they can ulcerate and bleed. They are benign tumors of the stomach, very common. So keep in mind, it, they are usually seen in the upper GI endoscopy. The gastric cancers and other upper GI malignancy is not that commonly seen, but it can be in older patients. Most important, we used to see a lot many years ago, stress ulcers, which are re related to the aspirin use, NSAIDs, uh, blood thinners, or alcohol. This is a diagrammatic representation of the upper GI bleed we just discussed. So this is the example of the gastric ulcers. So you see this, and this is a duodenal ulcer. Actually, if you see a little dark area, sometimes that's usually cauterized, probably, from bleeding. This is an example of esophageal varices. They look like snakes traveling in your stomach. It's GE junction, snakes. Look like snakes. Scary. But it does exist. And esophageal varices is very important, I should mention here. Varices bleeding may be the first presentation in a patient with cirrhosis. So must suspect something like that happening. A liver disease is common, and one-third of them cirrhosis will have a bleed. 
from the either from the esophagus or from the stomach, and very high mortality. So uh, GI bleed due to cirrhosis, watch out. Patient could have sang it in right in front of you. The stress ulcers or gastritis it used to be very common. It still exists, but not as common. It could be related to multiple erosions caused by organ failure. Go by, this is common with the NSAIDs. Sepsis can happen, and head injury is the name, special name. A Cushing ulcer, board question. Increased intracranial tension. Then the burn injuries is called curling ulcer. Then it can happen from massive trauma. That's related to stress of the body. This is an example of gastric erosions on this side, which has been cauterized by the electric cautery or bovi to the scope. Uh, this is what we discussed. I mentioned about aorta enteric fistula. It usually happens a person who has a graft. They develop a pseudoaneurysm, which subsequently erodes into the duodenum, fourth part of duodenum, because the duodenum sits on the aorta. It goes underneath, and then the aneurysm will cause erosion, and then the bleeding occurs, and uh, it can be massive, and sudden death is not uncommon in these patients. So most suspect somebody is bleeding massively in the upper GI tract. This is one of the conditions to think. And the surgical treatment is very unusual, uh, which I don't know how that works out, who invented it. It's pretty, pretty sophisticated. They have to do a ligate the order. You won't survive, right? But you do. Ligate the order, proximal to the graft, and then do a uh, extra anatomical bypass. That's called auxiliary to femoral, both sides. You put grafts, plastic grafts from the axilla to both femorals. Uh, that's interesting when we used to do. It takes about 10 to 16 hours to do this procedure. And this is an example of that bleeding. So this can be pretty massive. This is a fourth part of duodenum bleeding. So if somebody has vomiting blood with an older patient, keep that in mind. Uh, the cause of lower GI bleeding is, again, a, a, is with the age. If somebody is young, the commonest one is this, hemorrhoids. If somebody is old, then the commonest one is usually colitis. Keep this in mind, very common in ER, ischemic colitis. So somebody comes, the most hallmark of the lower GI bleeding, if somebody has a pain, watch out. It is not the verticular bleed usually. The verticular bleed usually either they hurt the verticulitis or they bleed. It's very unusual to have both at the same time, but it can happen. So the commonest in the older patient is the vertical bleed, young patient is this. The in between is anal fissures, all these angiodysplasia, colitis, uh, infectious, radiation, which is not common. We don't see it here in this area. Colon cancer is very common, and then all the information. This used to be very common. It's not that common we see in the ER. Most of these patients end up in, with a GI specialist in their offices. Uh, then Meckel's diverticulum is not a common thing, but you have to keep in mind a younger individual who are two to three years old and the tumors of small bowel and polyps are not that common. This is a diagrammatic representation where these tumors and the site of bleedings are we just discussed. Ischemic colitis is usually associated with the left colon, but it can be anywhere. And this is an example of Meckel's diverticulum, how it looks like. Uh, we have a case presentation later on, we'll see. Uh, interesting part of the Meckel diverticulum is, is a remnant of the vitiline duct when you're developing, when you're a little baby having fun with a connection to the mother, and that's what is left over. Um, so the important part of this is they can be bleeding, they can cause bleeding. The bleeding usually occurs from this source here or here, usually, unless there's in fact, you know, bleeding from here. Because they have ectopic gastric or pancreatic mucosa, which usually at the junction where the diverticulum meets with the small bowel. That's surgical part. I don't think you need to really be, go in detail on that. The rectal bleeding is less common uh, than the upper GI bleed but more common presenting complaint in the emergency room. 
85% rectal bleeding is from the colon, and 10% actually are from the upper GI bleed that end up with the rectal bleeding because of a brisk bleeding. Three to five percent involves small intestine, and it could be after surgery, post polypectomy. And this is an example of the polyp removal dichromatic representation. This is a two polyps. You see how many polyps? This is a probably familiar, familiar polyposis. It can happen. And this is an example of a hemorrhoids. It can be internal hemorrhoids or external. They both can bleed. The commonest we see in the ER, usually external, we see uh, thrombose hemorrhoid. When they get really bad, they rupture and they bleed. They can bleed otherwise too, or they can have anal tear. Uh, the most, ex most important thing, when you do a rectal exam, don't look for these. They are soft, you won't be able to feel them. You can't say, I did a rectal exam, I can feel internal hemorrhoids. Usually, they are soft, usually you can't tell. So, um, but they can be felt, but normally no. This is an example of a colon cancer, usually a polypoid mass, which may occupy most of the lumen of the colon. And this is an example of a diverticular bleed. See, coming from this diverticula, you could see significant amount of blood can be lost. The symptoms of the GI bleed usually are, uh, we discussed a little bit earlier, it could be hematemesis, could be bright red or coffee ground material, upper GI bleed, it could be hematoschesia, that's the blood in the stool, it could be maroon uh, or a dark or melanin type. It depends upon the amount of bleeding. Uh, abdominal cramps, could have bloody diarrhea, the patient may feel very faint, dizzy, it's weak, tired, pale looking, complain of short of breath, especially if they're severely anemic with lack of oxygen or they may convert into overt CHF and may have chest pain. Severe anemia due to occult bleeding and upper GI bleeding. If 59 years the male comes to see you with a hemoglobin of 5.6 with no symptoms, what's your diagnosis? 59 years old male comes with a hemoglobin of 6 or 5.9 with no symptom. Cancer of the cecum, very common. They can just present with anemia, they're slow bleeding, you wouldn't know. So if somebody's having hemoglobin low, older patient, think about colon cancer. It may, and these hemorrhages could cause hypertension, obviously tachycardia, decrease urine output and loss of consciousness, which we normally see in the ER. This is another very busy slide with a diagrammatic representation of symptoms sign we just discussed. The lab tests, which are, you can do basic studies of blood counts, uh, which is normally we do, we are good in doing, ordering these things. Stool exam for blood, and then if you suspect infection, you can add this up. Then how are we gonna diagnose this? A good history of physical examination, followed by rectal exam and NG insertion, if the patient tolerates. Upper and lower GI bleed, radiological examination is upper GI series and very minima. Wow, we don't do any ER. We used to do in 70s. I'm raised in the area where there was no ultrasound, there was no CAT scan, there was no Xerox papers. So we didn't copy anything, you have to take picture, and we didn't do an ultrasound, we didn't have any. We didn't have any CAT scan, so what we did, use this HEAD. So that's the only way you could diagnose and treat. If you don't, admit, don't see anything going westward, we admit them. That's why I'm used to admitting people. At those times, that's how we could do. And you investigate them with these x-rays. And upper endoscopy, lower G endoscopy came later on after my time, and which converted into video endoscope. Then you can do a small, I will show you an example, a small bowel, this is a new one, capsule small bowel endoscopy. And then uh, you can do a radionuclear scan. That was available in the late 80s. It depends upon the amount of bleed. If it's less than that, you may not see a positive scan. Then the CD abdomen angiogram, you can do that, but the bleeding has to be reasonably enough, that amount, the calculation, to show the bleeding site. We have some examples shortly. Then Meckel's diverticulum scan can be performed to check the Meckel diverticulum problem. This is an example of the um, colonoscope. I hope, I hope none of us have to have it. I used to do that, it's not fun. 
Oh, you can, you can say, oh, you're 50 years old, have a scope. Oh, not fun. It still requires a lot of uh, preparation. Patient, I have seen older patients, just preparation, they pass out. Just with the animal, they pass out. So then you give them a little blood, you give them a little Demerol, they pass out. So it's not, it's not easy. Um, uh, this is an example of a positive um, radionuclease scan we discuss. It can show in the form of that. Then Meckel scan, you can see a Meckel in the right low quadrant. Then this is an example of angiograms. You can see exervasation. There'll be more examples of that. Uh, there's a nice uh, demonstration of an angiogram. Now this can be performed nowadays in the ER with the modern techniques. And that's another example. Now this is a small ball endoscopy. What do you do? You swallow a capsule. I don't think I could do it. But that's what they do. You swallow a little atomic capsule here. It looks scary to me. And then the camera, it has a camera and everything, videoscopic camera. It goes all the way, intestine, then take pictures, and then you diagnose. The only problem with that is you really can't do any maneuvers like scope or anything like cautery or anything or take the polyps up. But I'll give you information. Anybody knows what's the length of this, total length of the GI tract is? 30 feet. Uh, video capsule endoscopy, which we just discussed. And then how to treat these patients? Uh, ABCs, history, localization of bleeding site and treatment. Initial assessment, monitoring vital signs, brief history, ask risk factors, medications, comodin, important, right here, we'll discuss shortly if we have time. Insert NG tube cell bleeding, then upper GI endoscope, if you think it could help available at that time. Um, this is my prediction, in the next 10 years, the, the ER doctor will be doing most likely upper GI endoscopy, it's my prediction, because you'll make more money. Um, that's what we do, a lot, a lot of things, sometimes it helps. Endoscopic method, pharmacotherapy, then angiographic techniques to, uh, to localize the site of bleeding, and finally, surgery. This is like diagrammatic representation, and we'll have briefly discuss a little bit in detail here. Then monitor vital signs, then give them a lot of fluids, blood products if necessary, find the source of bleeding, and eye cell irrigation if it's really bleeding. Black mode tube can be inserted if the patient has esophageal varices. Then this is what we normally like. PPI, protonics, and axiom, H2 blockers. What's the first drug invented for, P for H2 blockers? Tagamet. It's really not available anymore, really not, because a lot of side effects, it doesn't mix with a lot of drugs, so it's really not used anymore that much. So we have Pepsid or Zantac. What's, this, what's the common side effects you have to keep in mind the long-term Zantac? Neutropenia, keep that in mind. Somebody is a lot of Zantac, can get neutropenia. Then this one is a very expensive drug, can be used, we don't use much, but used in uh, tertiary care centers for uh, um, bleeding, usually due to esophageal varices. Now that's a little bit detailed, what we just discussed, ABC, et cetera, and then transfuse if it's hemoglobin less than eight, uh, especially if the patient is symptomatic. Then this is what, important part. If you want, you could use antacid. You can actually, we used to use a milk drip in 70s. Antacid and a milk. Uh, 30 cc of Maalox every hour, every two hours, or in a drip, even with the NG tube. Now one story was, we ordered a NG tube milk drip. One nurse gave an IV drip, the patient died. So be careful, we no longer usually do practice that. So when you say drip, she thought it's an IV. You get fat embolism, and die. And then PPI is a, usually one milligram, but you can do higher doses of bleeding. And there's a new information about PPIs. Uh, they do not recommend for long-term use, 
However, people have been using it. I've been using it for many years. Never had any problem, but you can guess to stromal tumors, gastric tumors, gastrinomas. But there's a misinformation. Keep in mind, if somebody uh, has on PPI, try to avoid use recephin. There's a recent information the last few months, they're getting fatal arrhythmias. Recephin and PPIs. Uh, this is another management in a little bit of a busy slide, same information. And the management, again, we just discussed. I won't waste your time too detail about that. Now, because we have some cases to discuss. This is a Blackmore tube. I'm going to give you some information. It's a very complicated looking tube. It's hard to swallow. It's pretty big. I don't know how people swallow. It's pretty big size, but it goes through the, you know, the mouth. And the important part is they have a esophageal balloon and they have a gastric balloon. And they're nasty looking devils. You cannot leave more than 24 hours you can't, but it's not safe because if you do, it causes gastric erosion and esophageal perforation. So you have to deflate the balloon and let the patient bleed, and I hope nothing happens, but it can. So this is, but it does help in various patients. The endoscopy emergency usually upper or lower, and can be, you can use heat coagulator or laser, surge, laser uh, to the scope. You can do, remove a mass if it's bleeding. You can do esophageal gastric viruses, ligate them, and sclerotherapy. We'll have some information later. Next slide. A limited section of the stomach, small intestine, or colon can be performed if the medical management fails. Uh, this is an example of uh, papticles of disease. They are seeing you know, by Jesus, they, they're a little, having a little cautery performed here. It's like a diagrammatic, it's not really a true picture. Uh, this is a true picture. These are the uh, cauterized lesions, some of them with the bleeding sites. Uh, this is I relatively new, but haven't gone on for 15, 20 years, that you can do a catheter-based angiograms. And then if you do find source of bleeding, especially the colon, you can infuse gel or some material to block that artery so bleeding may stop. And it's, it's, uh, it's right now it's done. Uh, emergency surgical intervention is um, you can do, find a source of bleeding on the stomach, ligate the bleeding, a limited gastric small bowel resection, clonic resection, partial gastrectomy or colectomy, depending upon the site of bleeding, vagotomy and pyloroplasty and bleeder, and ligation of peptic ulcer disease. That's what we use to the most common operation. In the upper GI bleed, and this was part of it, not that common, but this is what we used to do the most, and then we removed the colon if it's a lower GI bleed, uh, because we really have no other choice for those days. Then TIPS is a transjugal intrahepatic port systemic shunt. Uh, it can be done as an emergency basis through a little we'll guide wire, we'll show you shortly. And if that don't work, then you can do other shunts in the varices bleeding. This is an example of vagotomy and pleuroplasty. The vagotomy has two nerves. One is the anterior or it's left. Or posterior is the right nerve. Uh, the vagotomy can be several kinds, you know. Then you do pyloroplasty. Because if you cut the vagus nerve, the sphincter doesn't, uh, is connected to that because of the parasympathetic stimulation. The, the, the pylorus will not open. So you got to cut the sphincter, it's called pyloroplasty. Now, this is an example of types of Bigotomy, you really don't need to know that, but it's good to have general knowledge. Uh, it can be truncal, selective, or proximal, or highly selective. So the difference between that is, this is a truncal, they take the trunk out, then the selective is you cut below these two main branches. These are two. The anterior vagus nerve gives you the 
hepatic branch, which supply the gallbladder and liver, and the other one is a celiac trunk, this one from the posterior right. So you cut below that. So it saves the innervation to those organs. That's called selective. And the highly selective ergotomy is, is you cut these nerve, all these here. Then you leave a nerve here, one nerve in the end. One, the last one. See, this is cut over here, 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 here. But this one goes, and then this nerve is not cut. That goes through the pylorus and antrum. What's the name of this nerve? Anybody knows? L nerve of letter J. It's Spanish, uh, probably French, I believe. Letter jet in India, L-A-T-A-R-J-E-T. -E nerve of letter J is a board question. And the, after you cut the nerve, you can do a lot of things. You can do uh, vigotomy because that reduces the acid. Acid, those days, that's all we had. We didn't have no PPI those days. We vigotomy, then we do pleuroplasty or cut the stomach. You could do a Bilderoth one. That means you anastomose the stomach with the first part of duodenum. You cut the bad part. Or you can do Bilderoth two. That's a doctor's name who invented this procedure, Bilra. So you can do, a, you anastomose the jejunum to the stomach here, higher up. Bilra too, it looks pretty nasty, but it works. Then this is an example of suture ligation of bleeding peptic ulcer. Then this is an example of a transjugular hepatic duct, a shunt. You can see this here. Uh, this is a shunt here. Yeah. It kind of connects the hepatic vein with the portal vein. So the blood is shunted. So this is the portal vein. It doesn't, it's no longer, cannot, blood cannot go, so it, it goes to all these weird areas. Esophagus, this, 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 and, and, and then you get viruses. Uh, the prognosis is about 70, uh, the mortality is about 7 to 10% in patient GI bleed. Uh, more common, that is due to the other causes than the GI bleed, especially in the ER. Patients will have cancer, other problems, and this is what kills you most of them, coronary artery disease, because they decompensate. And be, uh, remember that some patients, about 15, 10 to 15% can re-bleed. And said, and anticoagulants shall be avoided if possible after GI bleed. Low dose aspirin, important. Maybe, that's the word, maybe started in seven days if absolutely necessary, plus PPIs to prevent bleeding, especially cardiac patient, stroke patient. Uh, this is. His presentation comes now. Okay, we got a 55-year-old Caucasian male brought in ER by EMS at 10 o'clock, uh, vomiting large amount of bright red blood three times since 7 a.m. And no, no black stools, feeling very weak and dizzy, no abdominal pain, passes here, GI bleed, has been drinking six beers, wow. It looked like we had the other day with uh, uh, St. Patrick's Day, that <laughs> guy. The guy had eight shots of vodka, and they told him he has a change of mental status. Oh, you're supposed to have that. <laughs> 22 years old, comes with a change of mental status. The nurse is excited about it. Oh, he has. And then I look at him, and they say, he's drunk. <laughs> so I sent him home an hour later. So <laughs> change his status. Um, so the examination revealed a very pale and weak, a uh, little fragile person with a low pressure. Okay, and the next is he looks like a little jaundiced, and he has liver is palpable, and a cold blood negative, hemoglobin is a little low, then gave him a little bit of saline, and you tube, bright red blood. Then immediately, Umberti endoscopy revealed a bleeding esophageal varices, sang uh, and black milk tube inserted, however, the bleeding continues, and then the green transfuse again, gave him this expensive stuff, no improvement, you know, lost about 2,000 or whatever, 5,000. Then this is a tube we just discussed, placed in. Then 
You can also do emergency esophageal ligation. You can put a ligature on these if they're bleeding. Or you can do the shunt we just discussed. And this is, a, this is how the shunt is done. They put a little catheter in the jugular vein, goes all the way to the hepatic vein. And then hepatic vein, they puncture the vein. Then they look for portal vein. It looks fascinating, but it does work. Then after the uh, radiologist put a shunt in, the bleeding slowed down. Six hours later, the bleeding still continues. Then he became hypotensive again, more blood given. Then a vascular surgeon consulted. He did a side-to-side -side portal cable shunt, and the bleeding stopped. The patient recovered, however, became lethargic, confused. What is happening here? Anybody knows? <clears throat> After the shunt, what happened? The patient goes into hepatic coma. Pre-coma, coma. It's very important. Patient feels good, looks good. Four hours later, he goes into coma. Somehow the blood is shunted. The body can't handle a lot of poisons already going right into your system, which were not going there before because of the urovenous uh, shunt. Then ceremonial goes up. Then you have to treat him. Obviously, he has liver failure, then treated with liver, you know, neomycin, etc. And then bleeding stop, patient went on liver transplant risk, because that's the only thing that's going to work. So the important thing in, 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 the, in the esophageal varices is very, very sick patients, tube first, transfusions, shunt, if that don't work, if possible, emergency scope, if that don't work, shunt, if that don't work, ligation, if that don't work, pray. A lot of people die, I've seen them, really they do. They die fast, within two, three, four hours. This is a second case. A 75 years old lady brought in by her daughter uh, with a history of severe fatigue. Very important case, actually it's a real case. Uh, sweating and dizziness, eight hours, and no other complaints. She has a history of AFib, diabetes, etc. No history of probably problems and take only small dose of aspirin. Then examination reveal a little pale looking lady like another won't talk to you. Bad borderline vital signs. Everything is negative, rectal exam negative, hemoglobin borderline. So every, everybody feeling good, they say just crazy. It's just old man, old lady dizzy, so what? Well, most of them have in the ER. Everybody's dizzy in the ER. Uh, internist was called. And then, because of no obvious cause, the internist said, please, I don't care. I don't think there's nothing wrong with her. Send the patient home. However, the ER doctor, guess who was he? That was me. <laughs> so I convinced the doctor, please, because of her age, please admit, especially when you're dizzy, we don't know what's going on. It could be hard, could be anything. So 45 minutes later, uh, after I talked to the doctor, she bled, massive, Rectal bleeding, mahogany color. She became hypertensive. Then we gave her some treatment, you know, in the ER, saline, etc. And the rectal bleeding stopped. However, emergency angiogram performed, which revealed a bleeding site. Left colon, the verticulum was bleeding. This procedure performed, we discussed, it didn't work. The surgical console obtained. She went under subtotal colectomy, major operation for this age. It's the only thing you could save. Uh, although the bleeding was in the sigmoid colon, but this patient could have uh, two bleeding sites. So the surgical treatment is usually removed most of the colon, the anastomosis, the sigmoid, or the rectum, to the ileum. So because you have only one chance to save the patient, you can't go back and redo the surgery. So you do a major one-time shot. Total take everything out, although it's a big surgery, but that's the only chance you're gonna get. So the patient did well. Okay, that's a little interesting case. A two years old comes, uh, uh, a African American male child, uh, 11 p.m., maroon colored stools, and then he has a vague abdominal pain off and on four months, and resolved without any diagnosis, so. Physical exam revealed, Nothing unusual, ultrasound normal, CAT scan 
machine, not operational, sounded like Twinsburg. So <laughs> we had almost every week. Uh, then the MECO scan was positive, which we don't have it there, but it's usually done in other peri areas. And the bleeding stopped, then a surgical consultation obtained. The patient had a MECO diverticulum. He went under through laparoscopic procedure, and the patient recovered completely. This is an example of a MECO diverticulum bleeding site. This is a scan we discussed. Okay. Uh, what, who, Okay, what's number two of Michael's diverticulum? It's a two inch long, it happens two feet from the GI, ileocecal valve, and two percent of people bleed, and two percent of have gastric mucosa. God knows what's two percent, it's too many twos. Okay, okay, I'll go briefly on this. I have a five minutes, but maybe three minutes I will finish this. Next topic is warfarin therapy. Uh, anybody knows what's going on here? Poor rat died. Because they gave him poison. The poison was Coumadin. That's what it used to be. And then this one here, <laughs> it looks like me, but I'm a rat, rat. Doctor is a rat too. So that's nice. Okay. So obviously everybody knows about what Coumadin is, how it works. I'll go over very quickly. And there he goes, poor guy. He's bleeding in, his heart bled. That's where the Coumadin works, kills him. They bleed in the heart, they die. But they, the guy says, well, we'll leave. what happens? The super poisons are more in the worse. Then the warfarin can be used in all these conditions we are all familiar with. Then the reason that warfarin is good, but it's been uh, studied extensively, cheaper, uh, not affected by kidney, low dose, and uh, used in many conditions. Wow, that's what you see in ER sometime. The cumulin toxicity can be called, if it's more than three or two, <coughs> give me two to three, it can be called supraturophatic, cumulin excess, cumulin toxicity, aloe ionic, over anticoagulation, cumulin overdose, whatever you want to call. It could be intentional, unintentional, or pediatric, which is a rare. Then, obviously, uh, this is important that you can hold for five days for any surgery. For minor surgery, you don't need to do anything. And then, if it's a serious problem, you must do a bridge anticoagulation. Then, obviously, you need to check them out here. Then, this is important. Somebody's on Comodin, take the green out, which has high dose of vitamin K. All right, this is another more detailed information, which you guys are very fully aware of. Okay, this is important here. One minute I'll take, I'll be done about one more minute. Bleeding, life-threatening bleeding, especially brain, could be GI or urine, especially brain is most common. IV, or you can use prothrombin complex concentrate, very expensive. And then these are units, it works in 30 minutes. Then fresh frozen plasma, this is not used anymore, transfusion, platelet transfusion. Then this is, this is another example, minor bleed, may or may not use common, uh, vitamin K, depending upon the patient, depending how the INR is. If it's over 10, I think I always use a little bit of vitamin K. If it's borderline, you can watch them. This is another example of surgery, what to do, just stop a few days. Okay, uh, these are the one, uh, 30 more seconds. Oral anticoagulant, which are common, is Aliquis, Xeralto, the most common thing we use. Uh, there is really not too many things we can do. Uh, it can, the only thing is we cannot use these with the prosthetic valve. It can be used some other. It's a cheaper fixed dose, IN are not needed, and a better compliance. And uh, very, very expensive. Uh, it's getting cheaper now. Um, about two or three dollar a pill now. So it's not as bad. And then the treatment uh, to stop this bleeding, we don't, we don't have much yet. The only drug we just came pipeline, which is available is this, which is uh, 10A for IV use. 
I don't know how expensive it is. I heard it's about twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars, something like that. Very expensive. So don't order in the ER. We don't have it, and you won't be able to afford it. These are new drugs which are pipeline, and these are the example of all three. All right. Any question which I don't have time? Go ahead, anyhow. <laughs> and and thank you very much. <laughs>